On va maintenant débuter la, la troisième présentation. Je vais prendre un moment pour euh, vous donner une brève bi biographie de, du docteur James Shepard. Docteur Shepard est un scientifique de la science du sol. Il est récemment retraité. Euh, il a obtenu un baccalauréat et une maîtrise de l'Université du Nebraska et un PhD en, en chimie des sols de l'Université de l'Illinois. Il a enseigné la physique des sols et l'irrigation. Il a aussi effectué des, des recherches en physique du sol et en irrigation à l'Université de Georgie. Avant d'accepter un poste à USDA, Service de recherche en agriculture, à Lincoln, Nebraska, où il a, terminé, euh, où il a travaillé une grande partie de sa carrière. Euh, durant une grande partie de sa carrière, il a développé des technologies pour aider les producteurs à réduire la charge d'azote dans les cours d'eau et l'essivage des nitrates vers les eaux souterraines. Cette initiative comprenait l'utilisation de technologies de télédétection et de capteurs pour les sols et les cultures. Parmi ces réalisations, on compte sa collaboration sur le développement du système de capteurs de couvert végétal, le Optic Erix, commercialisé par AgLeader. Il a pris sa retraite en 2008. Il travaille maintenant comme consultant. Ses expériences et expertises focus sur l'agriculture de précision, la télédétection, les capteurs de sol pour augmenter la profitabilité et l'optimisation de l'utilisation des engrais. Il a aussi été co-éditeur du journal Precision Agriculture durant trois ans. Jim? Thank you. Well, thanks to Nicholas and, and everybody here who made this trip possible. This is my first trip to Quebec City. It's been lovely so far. I've learned lots of things. Um, I look forward to learning a lot more, either from your questions or from the discussions that we might have later today or tomorrow. What, uh, I shouldn't have written so much stuff in this bibliography that they ask for. I gave you too much information. But one of the things that, um, I retired and, and I like to work with farmers. I grew up on a farm, still like to work with farmers and ride with them in their tractors. And so I learn a lot that way, and I think that it's a, a good way to stay in touch. But I come from Nebraska, where we have irrigation. And, and as I talk to people here, that really uh, takes a good bit of the risk out of the analysis and, and nitrogen management. But at the same time, it introduces other problems. So give and take, and, and so you'll have to sort of filter some of what I say But we've tried to develop technologies now to help fine-tune nitrogen management. So when I talk to farmers, uh, what they tell me is that if it meets one of these criteria, profitability and, and you name it there, um, and, and even regulations, they're going to be interested in thinking about adopting some of these technologies. But if they don't fit these criteria, they're probably going to go by the wayside. They, they won't be of interest to people. So putting myself now in the position of a scientist or you as a consultant, we need to try to ad address these needs either by, by yields, efficiency. Um, we talked about decision support systems, integration, of, of bringing all this stuff together. That's going to be the tough job. And, and finally, We hope to bring along then the environment. So this is nothing new to you, but it's, it's sort of where I'm coming from. Most of my career has been spent with nitrogen and, and trying to develop these new technologies. And, and what I would, would point out is that we've already heard about mineralization, manures, nitrate, residual nitrogen. These are the kind of things that are susceptible to spatial variability in the field. You know these things. We're not going to dwell on them. But here we are with fertilizers. That's the, the thing that the farmers have their hand on. And, and what, in the organization of this uh, session this morning, I think what you're going to or have seen and, and will see is, is a funneling now of the approaches and, and we're down to the point of, so what? How are we going to better manage some of these problems we have? And so that's what I'm going to try to try to deal with. Well, we've got um, soil testing out there. That's been around for a long time. Many farmers use it. Um, now we have the ability with GIS and GPS and this sort of thing to utilize some of the information 
that farmers have seen for many years. They drive over the field, they see the color differences, topography, those kind of things that are, they're intuitive to a farmer. And, and they are probably obvious to many other people. Once somebody points out to them, oh, these are the relationships we're talking about here. And, and for example, I'm gonna show you an example from an old time soil survey map from the US. You'll, you'll notice that there are many small fields in there. This picture was taken in about 1940. You'll see soil type boundaries drawn on there. You'll see old fields, uh, various types of things. In 1979, this was um, converted into a center pivot irrigated cornfield. It's been corn ever since, continuous corn. But this picture was taken in 92. And what you'll see is, is some patterns in there. And this was taken right after planting, just a, a plain old picture out of the airplane. In, in 1993, our EPA was very interested in picking up on the idea of precision agriculture is going to solve the nitrogen problem by making variable rate nitrogen recommendations. And so we were the, the one location in the US that got half a million dollars to do this over a three year period. Part of this involved a lot of soil sampling intensive soil sampling. So, so we sampled um, over in this field, it amounted to uh, 13 samples per acre, very intensive. Well, here we go, the, the economics, they, they <laughs> just aren't there. But yet, if you, if you think about management zones, all of a sudden you say, well, there's a lot cheaper way of getting about the same information and, and seeing some of the same patterns. So uh, that got us to, to thinking, well, we were already thinking, but this sort of confirmed the idea that, that there's a, a probability of using sensors or remote sensing to get at some of this information. Well, I don't have to tell you that th there's a lot of intuitive relationships here that Peter's talked about. Um, they're just going to be obvious to you, but I'm going to build upon this. And with the tractors now, with having GPS, we, we get elevation. And, and from that, you can generate slope. This tells us about landscape position. We can see soil color. We can make some inferences about that. Now we can link position and color. We, we automatically do that when we go to the field. We can tell some things about probable soil texture, especially if you know a little bit about the geology of the area. We're, we're getting everything all linked together now. Slope, texture, everything sort of fits together. When you get to the farmer, here we are. How do we put this together? And we started to talk about it, and I'm probably the least informed about how to get it done. I'm not a, a computer person like Peter. Um, I'm here to learn. So this is sort of where we're, we're coming from in the big challenge. But we have had some examples of some, some research fields. This was done back in the, about 2004, where we went into a, a center pivot irrigated field. Uh, this has got some rolling topography to it. But this was a student project. And, and we had GIS layers for bare soil image, elevation, slope, and EM38 five years of data, and a very sharp GIS specialist put this stuff together. And, and what he came up with was that based on um, the bare soil color, we could explain about 65% of the variability. But, but remember, folks, this was irrigated. That, that tends to take a lot of the uncertainty out of it. So. That's where we're different. And, and you have to filter out <laughs> some of the things I'm gonna say. Well, the other side of this thing is, when we started talking to farmers about high nitrate in the groundwater, and I will tell you that in the area that I'm from, we have about 30 parts per million nitrate nitrogen. That's nitrate nitrogen. That's three times higher than the safe drinking water standard. 
so that the farmers are saying, oh, I better be a little careful. They're, at least they're willing to listen. And, and so what they told us is, well, this is fine. If you want us to cut back on nitrogen, you have to be able to tell us when the plant needs more nitrogen, you have to be able to provide us a way to put that extra nitrogen on if it becomes deficient, and you can't reduce our yield or profitability. A big, tall order to do all this stuff. And so this is where we started working. In uh, We started with chlorophyll meters that Peter talked about, and you can recognize that those are not very applicable to whole field management. So I told my graduate student, we need a mobile chlorophyll meter, something that we can put on the tractor and, and do this automatically. And that was the beginning in 1993 of the sensors that we developed. So this is just an example. I brought one with me today, um, not, as a, not anything more than to let you see what it is, how they work, and uh, you can come up afterwards and, and play with it or look at it. But it's got built-in GPS and, and records the, the data, all these kind of things. You can come look at it afterwards. In, in a minute, after it warms up here, there you can see the, the pattern on the wall. So it's an active sensor. It works day or night. The further you get away, the, uh, the bigger the, the footprint. But the, uh, I, I think the issue is, can we use these things to make some comparisons in the field? Not necessarily to, to tell you how much fertilizer to put on, but in a relative sense, bring the farmer into the decision-making process. Up here. I must have hit something. This is a picture taken back in, the, um, in 1995 when we first started this this kind of thought process of, and it, uh, it's an old picture, but it really illustrates the point of being able to use the sensors, which are located up here above the crop, GPS and that sort of thing, but the, uh, the drop nozzles that are used to deliver the liquid nitrogen as we drive through the field. So on the go nitrogen applications. But this is not the only way of, of sensing variability and remote sensing is a really powerful tool I think and, and I'm going to show you some examples here but this is a in the city I come from Lincoln Nebraska they have a, a new baseball field it was only about two years old and um, it really looked great and in the image you might be able to see over here some shadows those are the the shadows of the the lights when the picture was taken we took these sensors and put them on a, a little gator, John Deere gator, and ran over the field. And this is the map we ended up with at the same, same day the picture was taken. The sensors are able to, to pick up things that we can't see in our eyes that perhaps we could extract from a, a bigger image. But you can tell where the center fielder played. You, you can. You can tell that when they cover the, the infield with a big tarp and they get rainfall, where does the water go? Thing, things like that, that it might not be obvious what's happening, but this is where it's important to show these kind of things to farmers. Oh yeah, I know what happened there. And, and so the interaction is really important. Well, let's, let's go on. Well, this is our bare soil image. Lots to be learned there. This is a case with color infrared imagery. And the, the, the dark area over here, it's got less vegetation. A hailstorm came through. So this was a soybean field. If you look even closer at the very bottom down here, you can see a difference in color. This is the difference between tilled, moist soil, and non-tilled soil. And you can, in fact, see where they're in the field here working. You might see some, some blotchy rectangles over here. This was a problem with the herbicides. The sprayer was not working properly. So a lot to be learned. This is a, an aerial photograph of a center pivot irrigation system. And it looks like a helicopter blade of some kind. This is one of the systems that has a, 
uh, they, I call it a tail, a swing arm comes out on the corners to make it more of a square field, except the control system didn't slow down when it needed that extra water. So when the, when the tail started to swing out here, it needs more water to turn on more and more nozzles, and so it robs the water from the rest of the field, that sort of thing. And finally, one of the most recent things is, is thermal imagery, especially related to irrigation and water distribution, but it can also be a good tool to tell you about rooting depth and water availability during the growing season. So these are just some tools that are out there to maybe help you explain some of the variability. Well, as we, as we go on, where does this nitrogen come from? We've heard a lot about mineralization. When does it happen? Is it during the growing season? Is it before the growing season? What's going to be available? A lot's been said about excess precipitation. That's a problem for us as well as for you. But at least in our case, if we run into a problem with excess precipitation, and we do sometimes, we've got all these center pivot irrigation systems with the ability to squirt nitrogen in them. So if we can detect a problem, it may cost us some more money, but we've got the ability to put some more nitrogen in the water. So in our state, we have about 70,000 of these big center pivot irrigation systems, and groundwater is the source of water. Well, as we drove around yesterday, I saw lots of ponded water, fields with, with water standing in them, and, and my perception is that when that frost goes out, it's gonna be like flush in the toilet. It's, it's gonna be gone either denitrified or it's gonna go one or the other, and we have the same problem, same problem. So now we're coming down to, to the mineralization component, and, and we would hope that we understand about how much nitrogen can be mineralized during the growing season. How can we capitalize on that or understand it to know how much fertilizer to put on? That's part of the big question, and, and I think it gets us back to what's the color of the soil, organic matter content, and will we have enough moisture in the soil to allow this mineralization to happen? So it's a big balancing act. Some of you may recognize the name Henry Wallace. Well, Henry was basically the, the founder, one of the founders of Pioneer Hybrid. He was the Secretary of Agriculture in the US, but he made a statement one time that says, there's no correlation between looks and yield. What he was talking about is, is in fact a number. Tell me how much, how many bushel I can get, what can I expect for yield, this sort of thing. And I would fully agree that it's, it's very difficult, if not impossible, reliably, to, to look at a crop when the, when the crop is waist high or, or so, and tell me how much grain I'm going to get so I can back calculate how much nitrogen to apply. But, but I would argue that Maybe in a relative sense, we can make this happen. And, and so the, the approach here, let me go back a second. The, the, the approach here is to, to somehow use, use a sensor during the growing season and, and say that's related to yield. Not the absolute amount, but we can look at the crop and assuming water is, is normal, average, we can maybe make that relationship. And so, Part of our approach has been that we have a lot of producers who would like to make this fertilizer application in a traditional side dress method. But we have uh, a number of people who are saying, I have the ability to do it later in the year. So I'm going to um, wait and see. When I start to see a problem in the field, then I will go fix it with a high clearance sprayer with a sensor. There were some questions here earlier, and, and I'm glad I put this slide in, but this is basically a, a typical nitrogen response function. What I wanted to point out is that if you look at the, the crop, you're likely to see a range of colors going across there from nitrogen deficient up to a, a point of 
where we have similar readings. It's luxury consumption. It's got ex extra nitrogen in it. We can't oversell these sensors. We can't oversell remote sensing. That They can't tell how much luxury consumption is out there, how much is happening. This is a, a potential problem because most of the farmers in the U.S., I contend, they're operating up here somewhere, probably not too far out, but, but they're walking back to the edge or thinking about it, but they don't want to fall off. They can't afford to do that. That's um, too risky for them. So Peter talked about risk. Where does that fit? There was a slide earlier about nitrogen uptake, and it, it, uh, I think it's important to understand the trend of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium uptake during the season. And what I wanted to show you, this is from a series of modern hybrids of the different growth stages up to about silking, the dry matter accumulation compared to the relative accumulation. Now, this is relative to harvest, but how much nitrogen is taken up. So the corn plant is a real pig. If you give it the nitrogen, it's going to take it. It's going to store it in the stock. It's going to do things. But so here we have what I would contend to be a window of opportunity. For some operators, it's not real big because they may not have high clearance equipment. They might not have ability to put the water or fertilizer in the water, a number of constraints. But nonetheless, I think you can start fairly early. And in most cases, we contend that you need to have the fertilizer on by about silking time, even though uh, there's about 40% of the nitrogen probably taken up after silking, but our studies with nitrogen or isotopic nitrogen show that you should really have it on if you want it to, to correct any deficiency. You should have it on by about silking time to make the difference. So I'll have a couple pictures like this that I've built upon, but our idea then is to somehow use this, this in-season measurement or assessment of, of crop vigor. Somehow use that and calculate a sufficiency index and, and then project. We're not going to estimate or are not going to give you an absolute yield. We're going to say it's a proportional yield that we might expect. So part of the dilemma for us has been, well, how do, we, how do we handle all this data? How do we handle it and in, in, in interpret it in terms of how the farmer makes a recommendation? And so the uh, one approach using a mass balance is we like to work with numbers. We want absolute numbers. And so we need to, to start with a prediction of real yield that we expect. And, and I, I have trouble with that, especially uh, considering the weather and climate and, and this uncertainty and locations across the country. So this is why we've gone with the relative yield approach. I'll show you what it amounts to. Here's our sufficiency index, and somehow we need a reference. This can be a, a high nitrogen reference or something that, that I call happy corn. Farmers will tell you, I can sleep at night if I, if I put this much fertilizer on and, and use that part of the field perhaps as this reference. And, and for the example, then, it, it would be interpreted to say, well, perhaps we have 92% of adequacy or, or 80 or, or whatever it is. So that's one approach. I think it's really important, though, to have some kind of reference because of uh, the, the previous questions talked about different fields, cultivar, growth stages, cropping history. These are all things that affect nitrogen availability to the crop. And so we need to try to take that out of it so we don't have to have a recommendation for each one of these. So here's an example now of our crop sufficiency index. This was taken in uh, 2009 at the nine leaf stage. So plants are going to be waist higher or so. And this is relative yield. You'll see a, a fairly good relationship there. So that's what we're building upon, that kind of information. Um, whether or not that we can predict, in this case it was 85%, could be explained by this, this um, B9 reading, but remember this is irrigated. We took the water uncertainty out of it. 
If we do it at, at V12, a little bit later, so the corn's on up here, getting ready to silk, we get the same general kind of, of relationship, but, but in that case, it turns out to be linear. But, but take a look over here. We're reaching a point over here of, of reaching that plateau. And, and that's what we would expect from what Peter showed us. So now what I've tried to do here is to say, how does that relate to nitrogen rate? So what we would do with our, our sensors or remote sensing in some way is to say, we can generate this sufficiency index. We can come across to our response function. We come down to a rate. And if we, we know the shape of that function, now we can say, well, that's the amount of fertilizer we probably need to put on or, or to get into the plant. Now, if we, we sort of go a little backwards here and say, we're going to take this sufficiency index from up here. We're going to put it in the denominator. How does it relate to relative yield? Once again, you've seen this figure, but it's a pretty good relationship. The relationship does not hold at the time of silking. When those tassels are coming out and the colors are changing, stay out of the field. The relationship is, again, pretty good after silking, after the silks have dried up, so the whole field is, looks about the same again. But then it's probably too late to make any kind of correction. It might be a good chance to go out into the field to collect some tissue samples or dig some, some holes, for, look at roots, to see why there's variability out there. That'll help you maybe next year. So with our, our, um, our sensor type approach, what the remote sensing people and the plant physiology people tell us is that the yield over here, it, it's proportional to chlorophyll content and, and the incoming radiation. How much energy we've got coming in, how much is our ability to capture that energy in that corn plant. So it's the chlorophyll that's capturing it, how much chlorophyll is there. That's the combination of, of biomass and chlorophyll. So that's what we're trying to measure with these sensors. Here we are again with the same kind of kind of graph, but you know, early in the season here, this is it uh, when the plants are, are waste high or less. There's not much nitrogen in the plant yet. It's got a long ways to go. And so this is where our window is of, of feeding the plant. If we have a way of avoiding putting the fertilizer on back here and running the risk of loss, how do we do that? How will it fit the farmer situations? And what um, we saw earlier, about 40% is taken up after silking. So how do we get that done? Well, there's no, no specific answer for everybody, but maybe there's an ability then of, of spoon feeding the crop with uh, high clearance sprayers or even conventional uh, side dress applicators, fertigation, these are the questions, and how much and when? Um, once again, I throw them out as options. So what we've tried to do, I'm an uh, agronomist, soil scientist, an old man, whatever, but, but I work with a, a really smart electrical engineer. He's the, the guy that built the sensor, and, and I just sort of kept him guided maybe in the right direction type thing. And, uh, but anyway, we tried to put together an algorithm that would be universal of sorts, but would entice people to come in and, and look at it to say, oh, I'd like to tinker with this or that. So we published it and didn't try to patent it or anything. But the idea being, Peter showed you many, many yield response functions, nitrogen rate and yield, different shapes and, and all these kind of things. The unique thing is that these are all biological systems in and one way or the other, they've got an arc here. They've got a, a quadratic function to them. And so what he's done um, is to analyze that and come up with uh, the algorithm that I'm going to show you in a second. But what we've built into it then is, and, and we wanted to start with something that the farmers could live with. Not, not a black box, but we wanted their input. That's why we said, well, what are you happy with? What's the economic rate if you know it? 
you can certainly tell us something about the credits. Here's our sensor information. And we also know that there will be some parts of the field where either because of, of uh, plant population, whatever, you don't have the ability to bring the yield up to the expected level, no matter what you do. It's, it's not going to happen. So no sense in fertilizing. We have a cutoff or back off function that you can back that out. And we also know that depending on, on the growth stage, there will be some amount of nitrogen already in the plant. So we try to take that into account. And then finally, how do we build into this the spatial characteristics of the field? And, and this is where we have a, a coefficient in there that will, will allow us to do that. And, and so this is the, the form of the equation, just the application rate. Here's our sensor information. Uh, uh, here's the, uh, the farmer information, the credits. Here's our sensor information. And the caution is that we didn't understand the system fully when we, when we built this thing. And that many times when we talk about nitrogen credits, these are really assessed at the end of the year at harvest time. And you know, that, so they say, well, soybeans, 50 pounds or 40 pounds per acre type thing. These sensor measurements are now being taken much earlier in the year. So what we're finding is that, that a lot of this is, is maybe partially incorporated in the, what the sensors are seeing, but not fully. And, and what happens to moisture thereafter is, is potentially um, up for grabs. Nicholas asked me to talk a little bit about how do we calibrate these sensors. And, and of course, when we started working with the chlorophyll meters, we were working with small plot studies nitrogen rates and, and walk through the plots and clip, 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 and, and, and that sort of thing. Well, that works, works well for small plots, but for a big field now, what do we do? Do we put a strip of extra nitrogen on the whole field? And, and then as soon as we do that, you're going to say, well, I know there's bound to be variability up and down that strip, even though we put extra nitrogen on. So what number do we use? And so this is where my, my engineering friend, again, not knowing a lot about uh, agronomy, said, uh, well, let's, let's work on uh, a, a strategy whereby we, we put some fertilizer on early and we come up with a, a virtual reference strip. The, the early nitrogen is intended to get around any stresses that might reduce yield potential. And, and then after that, we're going to come in with the sensors or remote sensing. And, and so what I'm going to show you here is a quick example of this is a, a field that we drove through the field. These are the sensor readings. And, and this is the frequency that we found those particular readings. So we found a, a pretty normal distribution in the field, a cumulative distribution. And so we took a, a statistical approach, two standard deviation units, and just said, OK, let's try this, 95 percentile value. Same kind of thing. So here we are with our, our sufficiency index. Very simple type thing. And this histogram can be developed with, within Excel. So it's, it's a quick thing to do. One of our, our colleagues at Oklahoma State University, they like to talk to farmers about how much, can you, how much additional yield can you get if you fertilize. Not, not your 95% of the way there, we can give you another 5% by fertilizing. And, and so I'm going to show you that example. It's very similar. It's the inverse. That's all it is. It's an inverse. But the thing that I wanted to point out, these sensors, they have a footprint, just like an aerial photograph has a pixel size. These things have a footprint. And, and they're not able to pick up um, color variations within the leaf that, that only we can see. So that, that's a caution. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, we'll get to the bottom here in a second. We've talked about all this. But the soil background, 
depending on how big the plants are, that color of the soil is going to have some influence. And, and so it's a, a caution. Once you close the canopy, then it, it's less of an influence. We talked about other kinds of information. It's not only the sensors that can be valuable to you, but there, there's spad meters, leaf area meters. There's ways of, of using imagery to get leaf area. And uptake, somebody talked about that, and certainly yield. So the, uh, the point I would make is, what's the reliability and the relationships of, of all these things to yield? When, I guess, uh, when are they most reliable? When are they convenient to take? What are the options for the farmers? We're getting close to the end now. But what I wanted to point out is, I said we have irrigation in Nebraska, but yet a, a very old long-term nitrogen study, you can see by the age, it's, it's old, but where they put on different rates of nitrogen fertilizer, notice the variability in the, the check plot yield. This was put on the same plot year after year after year. And this is one of my concerns, is that notice that the first year of the study, this would have been, the whole field would have been treated the same. Look what happens to the yield second year, third year, as we go back and back on the same, same land. And there's a lot of variability here. In terms of the real yield, the variability in, in the yield for the high nitrogen rate was like 13, had a coefficient of variation of 13% across all these years. It was 35% uh, across the check plots. And that, remember, was irrigated, folks. So, so a lot of this variability here relates to mineralization that, that either occurred uh, after the last crop, uh, residual carryover, uh, a lot of different things. So there you can see the relative yields, 160% type things. So the, the question once again, what should we use as this, this relative value? And now I flipped it over. I've taken the, the other approach saying, if you're, if you're interested in the check plot, how much can you improve yield by putting the fertilizer on? Well, here you can get over a threefold increase in yield in some years. But I contend that, that farmers are not going to have the ability or, or the knowledge to know what the check plot yield is going to be for them. They'll have a pretty good idea what, what they think is, is maybe the optimum for their current system. Maybe not what it can be, but, but what it is right now. And so th this is the uh, dilemma we face, I believe, is should we be using the yield response approach or the sufficiency index approach? Almost done, but we were asked to talk a little bit about global nitrogen and this sort of thing. We heard about nitrous oxides and, and some of those, those potential problems. Um, the literature says that anytime you've got nitrate in the soil, it's susceptible to denitrification and uh, anaero anaerobic conditions, it can go. So, so that's nothing new to people. It's a function of texture and drainage. We, we all know that sort of thing. So, so how can we somehow use this, this knowledge, build it into our, our practices and our recommendations? Now, in, in Iowa, they've, uh, in some cases, taken the tile drainage, comes out of the pipe. The water is glowing red with nitrate. No, well, not, not that, but, but it may be 50 parts per million coming out of there. So how do we take that out so that it doesn't end up in the drinking water of Des Moines, Iowa? And, and so they've come up with some uh, artificial bogs, um, artificial wetlands, with, with bark and organic matter to try to take that out. The question I might have is, well, you convert the nitrate to what? Does it go to N2? That's good. No problem. Does it go to some kind of NOx? Uh, not so good. So, so that's sort of the dilemma we're facing. And all along here, what we've tried to, I, I think about this, and we try to solve one problem and inadvertently we create two or three or four more. 
But I would also tell you that I'm old. For you young people, that's job security. Anyway, the thing that we, we don't publicize enough, I believe, to the public is by growing crops, we're really doing the environment a favor. They sort of take this for granted, that we're, we're capturing CO2 out of the atmosphere, we're releasing oxygen by the plants. Uh, they say, oh, that's a freebie to us, not to worry about it. But really, it's got some value. So I've enjoyed hearing and interacting with you. I, uh, once again, I thank you a great deal for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. I think we have time for one or two questions, and then we go for the discussion. So uh, yes, there is a question over there. Hi, my name is Ahmad Masu, from PhD student from McGill. Um, I got two questions. I uh, hope you don't mind. Uh, first question regarding the sensor application. So, how do you could justify the profitability index or return of investment if the farmers apply the sensor of, uh, for example, the sensor that you have right now? How could you justify the profitability? Of, how do we justify? Yes. Yeah. If the farmer applied, uh, well, used oh. the sensors. Oh. Okay. And the second question is, uh, based on the sensor uh, that you present here, it seems like uh, it could be used also to predict organic matter in the soil. Is it possible? Thank you. I'm going to answer the second one first. We we have taken this same same sensor, and and mounted it behind a corn planter, about 15 centimeters above the bare soil. We know that the moist soil has the most differential color, most vivid color. So the idea was, we'll go behind a corn planter where we've disturbed the soil, we've got moist soil, and we will monitor the color. The sensors work very well for that. But as you go in one direction, the wind is is, is blowing the dust ahead of you as you turn around. It's going the other way. And, and so you end up with dust, especially in Nebraska with a lot of wind blowing and, and, and causing a bit of a problem. So we've taken and, and made this into a chisel type type thing, into a, taking the sensor, embedded it in a um, about a one half inch thick chisel it does pretty well, except the, the vision, the sight, is very small. And so that's what we're in the process of, of blowing that up so we get a, a little bigger picture. But it, it then gives you moist soil within the, the top uh, root zone, and, and that works pretty well. Question about justifying this to the farmer. Um, it's not for everybody. And if you don't have a lot of variability, spatial variability in your field, don't even think about it. It, it. You can't afford to pay for it. When I worked with Ag Leader a little bit initially, and, and where they went to fields were in Missouri and Iowa, especially those that had manure applications. We heard about you don't know how much you put on, where you put it on, how many years it's been put on. And so you have a lot of variability out there that it's, it's potentially because of the manure. And so this was the idea of if they've already got a high clearance sprayer or somebody in the community, they're able to go out and, and spoon feed only those parts of the field that need it. And the other situation they ran into was they had some early season rainfall. After the farmers had put on their, their 50 pounds per acre pre-plant type application, the plants were up about yay tall. And, and they got about six inches of rain. Flush the toilet. <laughs> that's, that's, that's about what happened. And so the farmer came in and, and uh, in some cases, the sensor and the algorithm said put on way more fertilizer than the farmer was comfortable with. But it more than paid for it. And in that case, um, it paid him like $119 per acre 
for the fertilizer, the, the benefit of that kind of strategy. So I, I think there's selected situations where it can work very well. 